Welcome to the Log Church. I'm Pastor Luke, and we're really excited that you decided to join us today, whether you're watching online or if you happen to be at the church or down at the cafe. Wherever you happen to be watching from, if you're new to the Log Church, please let us know by filling out our online connection card at logchurchpa.org or by texting the word guest to 412-538-6688. We'd like to send you a free gift and some information about the church to help you get better connected. Now it's time to worship. Log Church, it's great to be with you. The Bible says God is great and greatly to be praised, and we just love the fact that we are pursued relentlessly by His love. Come on, would you stand and sing along with us now?
cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for. And now my life is yours, and I will sing.
Thank you again for being with us today. Those of you who are used to giving during our typical weekend service, we ask that you consider giving online. And as a reminder, you can give anytime online securely with the Give button at logchurchpa.org. Please join me as we open in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, we just thank you for today. We thank you for everything that you do in each and every one of our lives. And Lord, wherever we happen to be listening and watching from, whether we're online or whether we're at the church, Lord, I ask that you just speak to each and every one of us today. Use the preaching today to just minister to each and every one of our hearts. Speak through our pastor. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to just worship and serve and to love you. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for everything you do. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but the more and more we get closer to the election and start to really examine uh, what's going to what it's going to look like in November. I am not particularly enthused about already the different conversations that are going on on social media and, you know, in different news sites. It's really hard to stomach. And so as I was uh, reflecting on this week, of course, we know we had the Democratic National Convention. And, uh, you know, I, I just saw a lot of people posting about that. I saw a lot of people posting uh, from all different sides of the political spectrum. People are excited. People are miserable. You know, there's so many different things. And I have said this before in church, but in 2016, after the election ended, I thought, hey, this is going to be great because we're going to get back to normal and people are going to start being civil to each other again. This won't ever happen. And I didn't know that 2016 was just like a precursor to what we've been experiencing. So I don't care where you land on the political spectrum, but I will say I know what you've been thinking when you watch either your side do something or the other side do something. This is what you'll say, right? You'll say, I can't believe they would think this way, or I can't believe that this candidate would act this way, or I can't even believe that people are falling for what this guy said, or I can't even believe that they're actually entertaining what this woman is doing. And you start to have these thoughts that are very... Um, how do I say it? They're super judgmental, not in the judging the way the Bible describes, but you really start to judge other people's ability to judge, right? And it's easy to get wrapped into that. And so as we've gotten through a good portion of this year uh, and going through the pandemic and now we're heading into fall and there's still a lot of division about how to behave with regard to social distancing and all that stuff, we do that there too, don't we? I mean, really, we start to say, well, I can't believe this person would think, be okay sending their children to school. I can't believe this person would be okay not sending their children to school. And we, we just get this mindset when we look at people through this filter and the filter isn't particularly God-honoring. So today, I am going to share with you a secret. It's a secret that's going to help you to deal with what you feel when it comes to these types of issues. And if you really kind of get this secret internalized, if you really kind of understand how to view people, it's going to help you to really handle things in a way that I believe honors God more. So this is an easy sermon, and some of you are going to really, really identify with it right out of the gate. The title of the sermon is called, Everyone's a Mess. That's the title. I mean, really, everyone's a mess. That's it. Okay, put it on a t-shirt, bumper sticker, uh, make it your Facebook profile image. Everyone is a mess. I started thinking this way back in 2008, 2009. And it really helped me to overcome some of the different areas that we're going to be talking about today. But this is not an area that you will see expressly stated in Scripture. Like you're not going to see in John chapter 1, verse 7, Jesus said, all of you are messed up. It's not exactly like that. But there is so much implication about what God says concerning how we really are at our core. So I want to look at a story, a parable that Jesus told that really will help us to get this under control. Do you want it? First of all, I want to ask, do you want this under control? 
I mean, do you want to not look at people in a negative way? Do you want to really start to get back your ability to be a little bit optimistic about people? And I'm not saying that you just you know, put rose-colored glasses on and you're not careful. But what I'm saying is we have flown so far away from that. We have come so far away from mutually respecting people, caring about people, and looking at people through a lens of empathy that it's almost impossible for us to imagine getting back. Well, today you're in luck because we are going to go backwards. And once we start to realize that everyone's a mess, and once we realize what the implications of that is, what the implications are, I should say, you will be able to handle the election year. So this is like a really helpful, timely type of message for you. Now, let's look at this parable. And we're going to actually, the whole sermon is going to be this parable. Parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So an earthly story where it's not necessarily an exciting story. Like when Jesus talked in parables, it wasn't like, you know, oh, this is, it's not like the Lord of the Rings he's speaking of, right? Some of them were kind of riveting, like the prodigal son, but some of them were basically like, yeah, this guy owns a field and he harvested crops. And you're like, wow, that sounds like a bestseller. But most people don't realize that it's not necessarily how big the story is. It's the heavenly meaning behind it. So I want to examine a story called the tax collector and the Pharisee. And we're going to dissect this, and we're going to really examine how this affects you and I. So let's look at the story first. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 10, opens the story. It said, Jesus also told the parable to some whom trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Okay, now, I don't know if, like, I don't know if you've ever been in this situation, but you ever read something in the Bible, and you're like, I don't know what that means. Like, I think I know what that means, but like, I don't know the interpretation of it. Like, I might be going off, and I might be in the wrong interpretation. Sometimes, the Bible will actually tell you what it means, and this is one of those occasions. You don't have to interpret what this parable means, because Luke tells you right in the beginning, he says, he's going to talk in a parable where he's contrasting those who trusted in themselves and treated others with contempt versus those that have true faith. He's going to kind of go against those that are trusting in themselves. So you're like, what does this parable mean? It's right there. It's clear and plain as day. He says they trusted in themselves and they were righteous and they treated others with contempt. So let's get into the actual parable now that we know the meaning. He says, Two men went up to the temple to pray. One is a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. Okay, now, I'm going to really, really dive deep into this. For those of you that might be new to church or you kind of just gloss over these stories you don't understand, he's setting the stage and there's so much meaning between these two different individuals that if you understood it, you would already see how different these pictures are. First, we have a Pharisee, okay? And the, the Pharisee is the, the guy that is most associated with religion and spiritual leadership at the time of Jesus. Now, I'm always going to be very fair and balanced in how we go about this. At the time that Jesus was speaking, before the crucifixion, according to most historians, the Pharisees were the good guys. I mean, they were the ones that were responsible for upholding the religious law, and they would teach people. They were to be the examples of religiosity at the time, okay? So a lot of times we think of the Pharisees as just the people that killed Jesus. Before the Pharisees were involved with the murder of Jesus, the Pharisees were known and highly respected, and there were some good ones. But the problem is, over time, what had happened is the Pharisees became very prideful. And a lot of them, they went a step further. They used their spiritual platform to extort people and become power-driven. You know what they say, that, that uh, adage, absolute power corrupts absolutely? Well, they had the corner of the market with regard to the interpretation of God's laws to the Jewish people. 
So they would interpret them. They would explain them. But on top of that, unfortunately, they would add to them, which we're going to see that. So a lot of self-righteousness started to develop among the Pharisees. You'll see this constantly in Jesus's relationship to them. In the Gospels, Jesus is always having throwdowns with the Pharisees. They would come at him with some interpretation of the law. They would come at him with the fact that he was hanging out with people that most people wouldn't hang out with or that he was kind of revolutionary in his ideology when it comes to things like caring for the poor, loving people that are unlovable, loving people that are different. The Pharisees didn't tread on those grounds easily. And so when they saw Jesus behaving that way, it went against what they believed to be true godliness, okay? So that's the Pharisees. They were good at one point, but their goodness started to develop into spiritual pride, okay? So it says here that, remember, what's the point of the parable? I'm going to keep going back to this. He's illustrating when there are some that trust in their own righteousness and goodness, and he is delivering this parable to kind of afflict those people, to kind of say, hey, look, this is wrong. All right, now, on the other side of the coin is someone called a tax collector. Now, I've talked a lot about tax collectors in different sermons, but you have to understand what a tax collector was. A tax collector was a Jewish person who lived in the area, like a local, right? And what they would do is they would be responsible for the collection of taxes, hence the name tax collector, from their fellow Jews, and they would give those taxes to Roman officials. Now, you might think, well, that's not terrible. Well, it kind of is, because Rome was a godless type of nation. And on top of that, the Romans would delegate the collection of taxes Two groups of people called the tax collectors, Jewish people, that knew who lived where, they knew who made what, they knew what was going on in your bills, they knew how many children you had, they knew what your crops made, they knew all that, and they would come in and go, well, according to what I see here, you actually make quite a bit of money. And they would take enough to not only give the Romans, but the Romans would permit them, you ready for this? The Romans would permit them to kind of inflate that tax bill a little bit and keep portions for themselves. I mean, what an awesome job. And then what would happen is these tax collectors would become rich based on the inflated tax rates that they provided for the people that lived in their areas, their neighbors, their friends, people that they went to the market with, people that they knew from childhood, they used to go to synagogue with. I mean, these people became the most hated people of the Jews. They were hated in so many ways. That's why Jesus was always getting in trouble for hanging out with them. They're like, this guy hangs out with prostitutes and on top of that, tax collectors. I mean, I would dare say that a good portion were more offended that Jesus would hang out with tax collectors than that he was hanging out with prostitutes. That's how hated they were in the culture, okay? So you have to understand this. And Jesus spent a ton of time with them. Zacchaeus was a very wealthy tax collector. Matthew, okay, remember Matthew, the, the writer of the gospel of Matthew, was originally a tax collector. Remember that. And God calls him out of that lifestyle and calls him to follow Jesus. So tax collectors were a big part of Jesus's ministry, but they were hated by everyone. And what they were doing is borderline criminal and extortion. All very, very terrible because the Romans would enforce if the Jews didn't pay up the taxes and they would enforce them under the direction of the tax collector. So with that all being said, these two individuals couldn't be any more different. The only thing that kept them remotely together was that they both believed that it was important to worship at the temple. That was a big deal. Okay. So they knew they had to do it. The tax collector had to do it. The Pharisee had to do it. And they go up to the temple to pray. The Pharisee, armed with his lofty opinions of his spirituality, and the tax collector weighted down with the money of his friends in his pocket. Now, let's move along in the story and see how this unfolds, okay? In Luke chapter 11, or 18, verse 11 through 12, it says, the Pharisee 
stood by himself and prayed thus. Now pay attention to this prayer, okay? This is important. He says, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers. Okay, so he's going, God, I'm so glad, you know, I haven't cheated on my wife. God, I'm so glad I'm not like unjust, like really unholy, godless people. I'm so glad I'm not like extortioners. And then he stops. He looks over at the tax collector and he goes, and even like this tax collector over here. I'm nothing like them. And then he goes on to say, I fast twice a week. The law only required once. So he was overachieving and doing more than what was required. He says, and I give tithes of all that I get. Also exceeding what the law said. The law gave portions of things in different areas that they were to give a tithe from. The tax or this Pharisee is illustrating that he's doing even more than what God commanded or required because that's what the Pharisees would do. They would add to the law and they would make it so unbearable for Jewish people. It was impossible to live such a righteous way. So he is explaining essentially to God his spiritual resume. And we all know these kinds of people. They're all through the church, and it doesn't stop at the church. It actually goes out into public. There are some people that are so insecure that every time you meet them, they have to tell you all their accomplishments. Every time you talk to them, they have to tell you how much they work. Every time you talk to them, they have to tell you just to remind you how much money they made last year. They have to tell you that they are capable of doing a lot more than you are. And at the end of this, this will help you to understand this, and we're going to really unpackage some cool application to this, but when people talk like this, well, I'm not like this person, and I'm this, and I'm that, and all this is is I, 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 me, I, me, I, me. When people are like that, here's a little insight. They are the most insecure people in your life. They're so insecure. They're so afraid. They really, really are. And you can almost take it to the bank that you not talking like this shows that you're more confident and comfortable in your own skin. The Pharisee wasn't. So he goes to the temple and this is what his prayer is. He's basically telling God how awesome it is. God, you did such a good job making me like I'm killing it. Like imagine me getting up here, opening the service in prayer and be like, God, you know what? You, there's a lot of things that you made in this world that like, you know, they, they're kind of good. And some things, I don't know why you made them, but boy, when you made me, man, you're killing it in the making stuff department. I mean, you made me so good. Like, you made me have this insight. You made me have amazing good looks, public speaking ability out the wazoo, amazing sense of humor, humility. I mean, you, you, you really broke the mold with me, God. Thank you. Like, you would charge the stage, throw me off the platform, demand somebody else comes up here because it just sounds terrible. Well, this is exactly what this Pharisee is doing. Now, let's contrast it. Let's see what the tax collector does. It says in Luke chapter 18, verse 13, it says the tax collector standing afar off, so he's staying away from people, away from the Pharisee, away from other people that might be praying. He says he's standing afar off. He wouldn't even lift his eyes, wouldn't even open and lift his eyes to heaven. But instead, what does he do? He beats his breast. This is an Old Testament sign of contrition. Like it's, a, you know, he's just so like unbelievably broken in spirit. And it says, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So again, we have one who's focusing on what they've done, and the other is focusing simply on what they need of God and what God can do. Is there mercy for me? Is there mercy for me? He's crying out. Is there any chance you could be merciful to me? Do you know what I've done to my friends? I mean, do you know how much money I made this week to feed my family based on this horrible job that the Roman government gave me based on how much I wanted extra. Like I'm taking a vacation with the money that other people are impoverished because of. Like that's what I'm doing. You have no idea how wicked I am. You have no idea how big of a problem I am, how sinful I am. So nobody listening to this parable whether it was somebody that was on either side, would really have a problem with anything that Jesus was saying because it's all pretty accurate. But here is the kicker. And this is where Jesus' point of the parable comes into the spotlight. Watch what he says here. In Luke chapter 18, verse 14, he says, I tell you this, this man went down to his house justified. He's talking about the tax collector. 
rather than the other, instead of the Pharisee. Now, pay attention because this is the whole point of this sermon, okay? And then I'm going to give you some really practical ways to look at this because I know I've given you a lot of Bible stuff here. But once we get through this, you're going to say, oh, I see where you're going with this, okay? For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted, all right? Now, this is repeated over and over again in the New Testament, in, in uh, the epistle of James, in 1 Peter. It's, it's uh, repeated in some of the other gospels. Jesus talks about humility, and he talks about the characteristic of someone who's justified by God. That One of the main things we see here is a humility, a humility, a believing that you are a mess, Okay? And that's the point of this message. Here's what you need to understand, okay? I'm going to make this as simple as I can. The tax collector is a mess. He's a borderline criminal, immoral, unethical, hated by people. Everyone hates him. He hates himself. Everyone hates him, but he hates himself more. He is such a mess that he can't even pray. He can't even lift up his eyes because he's such a mess and he knows it. And so he is just devastated with how bad he is. And to tell you the truth, I've encountered people like that too, and so have you. Some people, they won't come to church, they won't come to God because they are so wicked. They know who they are. At, at the end of the night, they stay up thinking about their misdeeds, and it just destroys them. It drives them to this guilt, this godless guilt. That's where this tax collector is. He is a mess. Now, let me tell you the other part of this. Ready? The Pharisee the religious leader, is a mess. He's a mess. He's a mess. He's doing more than what the law requires. He is actually going to God, bragging to God about how good he is, telling God his resume, saying why he is awesome and how all these other people are bad. He is a mess. He's deluded. He's not dealing with any of his problems on the side that he has as a result, this pride. He's not dealing with it. He is a mess. He is jacked. He is just as much of a mess as the Pharisee or as the tax collector. And he needs God's mercy just as much as the person who's a borderline criminal. He just doesn't know it. He doesn't know it, which makes him equally, if not more, of a mess than the one who knows that he needs God's mercy. Everyone is a mess. The Democrats in your life, they are a mess. The Republicans in your life, the super conservatives, the ones that believe, you know, pro-life all the way, you know, they, they believe in capitalism, all that stuff, they're a mess. The people that are really, really strong and opinionated about the things that they should or shouldn't be doing with regard to the virus, that they believe that you should wear a mask in your car and you should wear a mask on the street, no matter what, if you're out in public, you are a mess. To those of you that are like, yeah, I don't wear a mask anywhere. I won't wear it in a store. I don't care. They can throw me in jail. You're a mess. All of us are a mess. And the problem is you don't recognize you're part of the mess. You don't recognize it. And I'm here to tell you, thank God you came to church today online. My message to you is you're a hot, stinking mess, okay? Tell that to your spouse. Tell that to your kids. Tell that to your family. Boy, oh boy, guess what I found out today? Pastor Sam told me I'm nothing but a big, stinking mess. Happy Sunday, folks. Welcome to fall. You're a mess, okay? Now, you have to accept that. And some of you are like, but you don't understand. Like, I'm not as bad as, and we're going to talk about why that is a problem. So I'm going to give you three things that you need to consider that are going to change the way you deal with the people in your life, like the tax collector where you stand and you're like, I'm holy. I'm living, I'm living the best version of my life. I read all of the John Ortberg books. I mean, I really have followed all of John MacArthur's teachings. Like, I am not a mess. I am whole. You're whole in Christ, but apart from Christ, you're not. And there's three things that you need to keep reminding yourself to kind of give you balanced thinking about how much of a mess you are. Okay, so here's the first one. Ready? Number one, 
you're used to your own brand of mess. You're used to it, okay? So you are comfortable in your messy mess. Like you're comfortable there because it's your brand. It's yours. Like you're, you're good with that. Like you forget how messy you actually are. You forget how jacked up your thinking is. You forget how bad your childhood was. And you're like, no, nah, I'm all good. Like I, my dad did this, my mom did that. I don't have any issues at all. I'm, I'm completely fine. No, 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 you're a mess, okay? I love you doll, but you're a mess, all right? So how do I know this, okay? Because everybody thinks the same way with regard to this. Everybody thinks the same way with regard to this. We don't naturally think the way that I'm telling you to think. I don't naturally think the way I'm telling you to think. Just so you know, I'm super comfortable in my mess. Like warm blanket comfortable on a fall morning in my mess. All of us are the same way, but we all are comfortable in our own mess, all right? Exhibit A, let me give you an illustration. You're gonna love this, all right? There was a company in Procter and Gamble, you know Procter and Gamble, they came up with a product that was a revolutionary product that most of you most likely have in your houses. That product is a product called Febreze. Febreze was an odor, and this was groundbreaking. The patent and technology behind it was groundbreaking. And, and this story is told in a book by Charles Duhigg called The Power of Habit. But the illustration is so powerful to what we're talking about. This is mind-blowing, all right? So they came up with this product that wasn't entirely a cleaning product. And what it was, was it was a product that you could spray that actually takes away odors in your house. So at the time, they were really trying to market it to two specific groups of people. They were trying to go after smokers. And this is, you know, early on before smoking, you know, had the stigmas that it does now. It had stigmas, but you have to admit that that's ramped up. And they were really trying to appropriately market it to pet owners. Okay, so they launched these two campaigns, these two ad campaigns. One of the campaign featured a big dog. And the campaign said, oh, you know your house and you know this dog. I think the dog's name is Sophie, which is funny because that's our dog's name. They said, Sophie's always going to smell like Sophie, but that doesn't make your house not a home. And then they showed somebody spraying the Febreze on the couch and the odor would be lifted and it would go away. And it worked. I mean, scientifically, this wasn't a gimmick. Like they figured out how to kill odors using this antibacterial type of thing to kill the odors. And it actually improved the smell quality. So they marketed it. They gave it to tons of different people in test subjects. People loved it. Like, oh, this smells so good. This is great. Makes, okay, but ready for this? The marketing bombed. And nobody bought it initially. So they dispatched a team of people to try to figure out why Febreze wasn't selling. Like, how is this not selling? It works. The people that have tested it love it, but nobody was selling it. So they found some people that were pet owners that they were marketing to. And, you know, I'm a pet owner, so, you know, there's smells associated with pets, right? So they went to this one lady that had like 10 cats, all right? And they said, well, we sent you the Febreze. Did you go, oh yeah, I loved it. So they said, can we see it? And can we see that you used it? So she opened up a cabinet and she pulled out the Febreze and the Febreze like wasn't used at all. It was used like twice, okay? And then they said, well, where would you typically use it? She goes, well, what I would do is I would use it in a room where my cats tend to migrate, which is the living room. So they walked into the living room and the person that was recording this in the book, they said that the smell was overwhelming. Like there, the, there was a group of them there. One of them had to actually step outside because it smelled so bad, all right? And this woman's standing there with the Febreze, and they said, did, did you use it in here to, you know, kind of get rid of this odor with the cats and everything? And she's like, well, I used it if there was a problem, but I, I don't really smell anything. I don't smell any problem. That is exactly, exactly what our problem is with our sin. We are nose blind to our own stinkiness when it comes to our sin. We get so comfortable. We get so relaxed doing the things that we do repeatedly that hurt our relationship with God and hurt ourselves. And we get so uncomfortable 
with other people. It's easy to spot when somebody else, like if you're a cat person, you know, you recognize when somebody smells like dog. If you're a non-smoker, you recognize that somebody smells like cigarettes, okay? Because you're not used to that, all right? And I'm not, you know, I'm not nagging on any particular group, but what I'm saying is we get accustomed to things that we probably should start to really examine in our lives spiritually that aren't going well. Or I should say, we get comfortable in our mess. We're used to our mess, all right? Here's the second thing I want you to consider, ready? You have to stop comparing your goodness with other people's badness. You have to stop comparing your goodness with other people's badness. And we do this so frequently, it's alarming, especially in the church. And we do it in the political spectrum too. Well, I'm this and I believe this, and at least I don't believe like this person believes. Or you say, you know, hey, look, I haven't prayed and I haven't talked to God in a while, but at least I come to church or at least I give or at least I... And what we do is we have in mind the ideal bad person. And we have in mind that neighbor of yours that, you know, swears and drinks every single weekend and, you know, is abusive. And you're like, well, I'm not like them. And what we do is we take the good things that we believe about ourselves and we compare them to the worst of other people. But it doesn't work. It doesn't work. You know why? Because we're forgetting that in our hearts, we are a mess. And we're comparing our best to somebody else's worst. And Jesus set this whole parable up by saying that people were trusting in their own righteousness, their own goodness. And yet, that has caused them to have contempt for other people because it doesn't work. Didn't work for the Pharisee, didn't work for the tax collector. The tax collector left justified because he recognized what he needed over what he had done. And that brings me to the final part of this and the most important part. How do we do this? How do we stop this? It's simple. Stop focusing. Don't think about what you've done, but think about what's been done for you. Don't think about what you've done Don't think about your good deeds. Don't think about your church involvement. Don't think about how much you know about the Bible. Don't think about how much you have done for other people. Instead, as a Christian or as a person that is longing for a relationship with God, stop and think about what has been done for you. Meaning, what has God done for you? What does the gospel mean to you? There's a story about two Port Authority workers in New York City during 9-11, September 11th, 2001. Will Jamino and John McLaughlin, okay? They were on the bottom floor of the South Tower providing relief for people that were getting trapped in the building when the tower came down around them. They were locked in all the way underground, you know, they were shuttered in by debris and they had absolutely no hope of getting out of there. They were dead, dead, no chance, no hope. In Connecticut, about two hours away from Manhattan, there was a man and he was watching like the whole rest of the world was watching. And his name was David Carnes. He was a 23-year veteran, career military person who had retired and entered civilian life as an accountant. So he's got spreadsheets open and doing all this work as an accountant. He's a businessman. He's wearing a suit. He sees what happens in Manhattan. He sees what's going on. Something in his mind snaps into action, and he drives as fast as he can to a barbershop. He gets to the barber shop and he orders the barber that's working there to give him the highest and tightest haircut, just as though he was going away into active military duty. So they give him that. Then he has in his car a change of clothes. He changes into his old military fatigues and he floors it to Manhattan. It takes him a couple hours, but he drives close to 120 miles an hour and he arrives at ground 
Zero. Well, there were already relief crews coming in, and they were pushing people away that were, you know, trying to search for people. But because he was dressed as a military person, because he had that getup, he was able to get into the gate. And what he did is he started to look at the debris, despite how dangerous it was, and listen and look for survivors. And he heard a tapping, a really faint tapping, coming from the wreckage of the South Tower. And with a crew of other military people and firemen and police officers, he rescued both John McLaughlin and Will Jamino. And it was because of him doing that, him coming out there and bringing them out of the rubble that they were saved. Folks, that is exactly the gospel. Just like this man took off his really expensive suit and armed himself and put on this uncomfortable military getup that he was used to wearing for 20-some years. Jesus laid aside his royal robe and he came into human history to rescue our perishing souls. And as Christians, there is no room whatsoever for contempt against other people when we throw it into the balance of what has been done so that we could call ourselves the children of God. Jesus did everything. Jesus took us. We were dead, and Jesus made us come to life. Jesus rescued us. We were perished. We were gone, and he brought us into light. It's all because of Jesus. And the moment we start getting our minds and thinking, well, yeah, but since I met Jesus, I've done this, and since I've met Jesus, I've done that, and I've done a lot more than this person. Stop. Jesus said, apart from him, we can do nothing. And if it wasn't for God's rescuing act of redemption, we would be lost, we would be perishing, we would be eternally separated by, from God in hell by our sin without any hope of rescue. Because of what Jesus has done, we can recognize that we're a mess, but we're loved. And because of what Jesus has done, we can also recognize that everyone around us is also a mess. And that God's love for them extends the same. And his redemption works just as much. Let's focus on that. Let's not get too wrapped up in who we think we are. Let's remember instead what's been done for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your unbelievable act of love in Jesus Christ, dying on the cross for our sin, pouring out his blood for the sinful person, for rising from the grave, conquering our death, conquering our shame, and allowing us to have part in his kingdom. Father, we owe you all things. We are unworthy. We need your mercy. We depend upon your mercy for every single moment that we have. Let us not take for granted that we are a mess. And Father, let us look at everyone around us as also someone who is a mess, someone who's in need of your mercy, someone who, like us, is lost. Let us look with compassion and empathy instead of judgment and contempt. Let us look to others with hope that you are at work and not with discouragement at the divisions in our country and in our lives right now. We thank you for this and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the Log Church. Let's talk about some information and announcements. The women's ministry is having a one-day retreat called Faithfully Grounded on September 12th. Space is going to be limited, so make sure that you register, ladies, before September 1st at the church's website or by calling the office. The men's ministry's Friday night fellowships are back in full swing. They meet at seven o'clock up at the youth building on Friday nights, and you can reach out to Jeremy on the Romans 12 Men's Facebook page if you have any questions. If you have children in the nursery, we're still looking for some volunteers. Please call the church office and sign up to volunteer as soon as possible. Our growth groups are kicking off again. You can sign up a couple of different ways, the tables at church, the church's website, or by texting the word groups to 412-538-6688. Hello everyone, Pastor Ron here. I trust that you're well and you're having a pleasant summer. 
I am so excited to be letting you know that we will be having the refinery kickoff pool parties right here on the church property. We're gonna be having two pool parties. The first one is for high school students from 9th through 12th grade, and that pool party will be held Saturday, August 29th from 7 to 9 p.m. The middle school party for students in 6th through 8th grade will be held Sunday, August the 30th from 12 to 2 p.m. All students can meet us at the youth building. The party is free as usual. There'll be great food, fun, as well as time to reconnect with friends and leaders from the refinery. Masks are welcome everywhere but in the pool, but not required. If you have any questions, have your students call their growth group leader, or if your student is new, you can call me here at the church at 412-344-4426. Stay tuned as I will have more exciting information regarding the refinery in the coming weeks. Bye. And we're excited to let you know that we're offering all of our regularly scheduled services at the church and cafe. Saturdays at 6, Sundays at 8.45, 9.45, and 11. Thank you, everybody. Have an amazing weekend, and God bless.